end of the century, but also to the end of the current water supply contract period, which, which run out in 2085 uh, with and without adaptation. And it'll show how combinations of projects can be more than the sum of their parts, right? How they can work together and really not just move water, but but store it into these uh, into these dry, for these dry years, and really show how we're preparing for a hotter, more extreme future. So the here's the the list of different SWP adaptation measures that we're currently working on. The ones in red are the ones that. Um, kind of are the biggest ones that we feel like we can model and account for quantitatively in our water supply. But all of these are important and, and I'll just point to Feather River Watershed Management, connect to some of the things that Mike was talking about with forest, uh, both restoration after fires and, and forest management before fires to, to, to thin those fires and, and get those forests uh, to be more healthy and, and more uh, fire resistant, and we're working on that as well. It's very hard to quantify that in terms of a, a water supply benefit at this point. Uh, so we're looking at Delta, the Delta Conveyance Project, the California Aqueduct Subsidence Project to restore the aqueduct through the San Joaquin Valley to its, its design capabilities, uh, an increase in south of Delta storage, um, forecast informed reservoir operations and our SWP enhanced asset management. So that's really about making sure all of our pumping plants and our facilities are really in tip top operating condition so that they're ready and available to move water when it's available uh, and not out of service for some kind of, you know, uh, you know, big machines like that fail uh, on, on a, you know, on a periodic basis. And so uh, better maintenance and better um, operating schedules can, can really enhance our ability to move water. All right, so just some some kind of key takeaways, and then I'll I'll I'll, move, I'll uh, let the bureau take over here. Uh, if we don't act, changes in snow accumulation, precipitation, temperature, and sea level rise are going to reduce deliveries. Average SWP deliveries will be will will go down by you know ten percent or or more. Uh, dry and critical year deliveries go down by 20% or more. So the impacts in, in those really bad years are even more extreme. But that doesn't mean that there isn't water. Uh, in general, it's just that our current infrastructure wasn't designed for these conditions. Uh, and we're, we're not able to capture that water when it comes uh, and move it and, and store it uh, in storage uh, and get it into those dry years. And so we we take a big hit, we, we don't capture the wet years, and then we take a big air hit in the dry years. And that's what you're seeing. Mm -hmm. uh, and then the adaptation plan really will show how adaptation can lead to alternative futures and mitigate some of those climate impacts, how multiple adaptation strategies can work together. So if we have conveyance around the Delta and storage south of the Delta, can that work together to really uh, buffer some of those dry years? And then what are our residual vulnerabilities that we continue to have to plan for and adapt to? And what are the, you know, what are the, the aspects that we, we have to develop new projects and new approaches to, to, to solve? That? I will. So, thank you, Andrew. Yeah. Next up. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Does it matter which one of you goes first? Levi. Levi can go first. Keep in mind, we would like if we can to have uh, at least fifteen minutes of questions at the end. So if the two of you combine could be twenty-five minutes, that would be wonderful. Sure, that's what we plan for. Yeah, it's a nice one. It's got a nice way to it. And everyone, uh, oh, I'm doing a blur of information today. Sorry. So hopefully, I'll try to boil down uh, some bottom line messages up front. <laughs> And then uh, underscore some slides and then be brief about it. Um, I'm Levi Brecky, I'm Senior Advisor for Research and Development and Reclamation located in Denver. 
Uh, I'm gonna, I was invited to share some perspectives on our policy and approaches at the bureau wide or the interior national level. So I'll, I'll quickly get to that. Um, reclamation, for folks unfamiliar, we're situated in the Western 17th contiguous states. Uh, so uh, well, there's a lot of variety of our uh, water resource management situations in the West, and that gives rise to a diversity of approaches on how we're addressing climate change, but we try to foster some health purposes. Um, four points, uh, or three points, actually. The first point is, uh, you know, Climate is changing, but our statutes, our regulations, our binding obligations, they are not. So think of reclamation's approach as we're trying to maintain legally defensible water resource management within that unchanging frame of statutes, regulations, and constraints as nature's drifting underneath all that. Uh, second point, uh, we have at this point a pretty long history of disclosing the sensitivity of our specific action planning, specific action environmental compliance results to climate change scenarios. So we've disclosed sensitivity, period. Rarely have we gone beyond to deal with the uncertainty of climate change, to identify the climate change we expect and bank on it and make our investments reflect that. So giving over that hump is, is a challenge. And that's the third point, getting over the hump. So our, our current, our focus in the last two or three years has been on a man, like a, a managed retreat rather than unmanaged retreat or manage, uh, managing for change. Um, and you're gonna hear, hear themes in that in the department's recent climate policy updates and also how reclamation is trying to uh, develop guidance for our various specific action planning situations where yeah. Uh, it varies if you talk about water supply planning versus dam safety corrective actions versus, you know, extraordinary maintenance investments on what aging water infrastructure. It's all a different planning context, but we're trying to foster a common way of thinking uh, on, on dealing with the uncertainty of climate change. So uh, I'm going to come back to this. Just, just a real quick brief uh, synopsis of how Reclamation and Bureau is addressing climate change. We have a variety of activities. Uh, Secure Water Act from 2009 authorized us to report to Congress rhythmically every five years on future supply and demand gaps under climate change, and we've done that. And also uh, report on adaptation possibilities, adaptation strategies. And we also do financial assistance through water smart basin studies throughout the West to try to explore adaptation possibilities. I'll come back to the DUI policies. Um, Reclamation's had a climate change adaptation policy since 2016. We've maintained that. We've had a strategy since 2014. We refreshed it in 2023. So we're, we're you know, incrementally evolving our policy and strategy. In 2021, we stood up a, a new bureau-wide uh, climate change community of practice, spanning all sectors wherever climate change touches our mission, trying to foster common understanding and think and thought about it. I'm a science application. And we also invest in uh, capabilities in our, amongst our non-federal partners to adapt to climate change and build resilience through Bill and IRA. Uh, speed history of, uh, rec of approach to addressing climate change and reclamation uh, kind of started in California. We had a couple uh, pretty basic environmental compliance specific action studies that got uh, challenged on many fronts in the administrative record, but common to both was absence of addressing climate change, failure to consider climate change. And that motivated leadership conversation to figure out, well, we gotta you know, disclose how the results of these studies were sensitive, but there wasn't confidence then to hang your hat on any specific aspect, aspect of climate change, not to bank on it. So where we landed um, was kind of a, as far as the longer lead, longer view studies, they would look at quantitative sensitivity analysis, which is, circled in, in green there. And uh, again, just disclose how the results were sensitive to a variety of climate change scenarios, non-committal to any other. <laughs> and the first example was actually in CBP SWP OCAP 2008. And we, we had a few scenarios which showed how supplies and demands and sea level rise change with response to climate change might affect the results. Um, approaches evolved. 
Uh, we started to learn that we can do different climate change definitions, whether it's delta scenarios about a change in monthly mean climate or a hybrid delta change in monthly variability. We also recognize that probably more significant, significantly that climate change scenarios are probably more robust if they're informed by ensembles of projections rather than single projections. You know, emphasize that consensus change, but still, it's just what's possible. It wasn't a commitment. Uh, and then just a, on the side, Colorado Basin's a different animal. They have two large reservoirs. It's an initial condition planning problem. They also have a, a wealth of paleoclimate proxy information in the basin that everyone's very comfortable with. So they tend to be gourmet cooks when it comes to blending climate information from paleo observed and projected, more so than I've seen. So that's uh, that, that's a speed history to where we're at now. So I mentioned, you know, most of our experience, not all, but most of our experience has just been about disclosing climate change sensitivity, period. And we're trying to get our community to pivot and actually manage for change. That means account for the change we believe has occurred, like Andrew said, and also uh, do a weight of evidence look at the available climate science theory, observations, model book. And what is the climate change we expect to continue to occur in the future? And make that judgment call. And um, getting people to pivot to that managed for change is, is culturally challenging because engineers don't want to be wrong. And, and, and uh, they have a lot of opinions on how it ought to be done. So we're dealing with a lot of a wealth of thought. Um, anyway, so we've been working on climate informed decision making guidance uh, to foster that mindset and uh, framework for approach. And we're hoping to issue this in reclamation for all of our again, reclamation wide community by this fall. But it, it has six steps. Um, uh, basically, uh, you know, familiar front end of gather decision information, identify your climate sensitivities. But what's relatively new, like Andrew underscore for the state as well, is steps three and four. Uh, don't forget to look at historical non-stationarity and, and assess what seems to be changing, what you can attribute to climate change. And that offers some weight of evidence as you then look forward and, and, and let that bear influence on how you weigh all the forward information. That's step slide and six. My last slide, I'm going to back up to that department slide. So in parallel to Reclamation working on its climate change guidance on accounting for the past and determining expected future, there was a similar thought pivot happening in the department. So after the new administration came in, they issued their executive order on, you know, strengthening our approach to building climate resilience. They instructed agencies, go forth, do that with your policies. And so Interior did. They formed a, a team of bureau climate leads from like nine bureaus and three department offices. And they had a theme. They wanted to manage ecological transformation. So like Park Service and BLM, they had some key themes like, uh, like Fish and Wildlife Service, they brought up, well, somehow we need to make room to consider resisting some threats, for example, or manage retreat or whatever on the ecology side. And reclamation was like, well, a good start would just to be go beyond disclosing sensitivities to actually select the climate change that you think is got the most credible and bake that into your future affected environment assumptions, your future no action stuff. And so, um, those, and there were other voices that were heard. So all those voices came together. Um, there was a cadre of about 100 folks from all those bureaus and offices. And they worked on policy revisions to strengthen departmental, department-wide approaches to building climate resilience. It's in sync with what we heard from Andrew and most speakers today. But um, some of the key themes are earlier engagement with partners, uh, applying high quality climate information, including indigenous knowledge, and not just Western science to not just evaluate actions, but also shape them and, and, and take the opportunity to shape actions through that earlier partner engagement, employ landscape perspectives, and use adaptive management to when when possible or when appropriate to navigate the, the tougher uncertainties. So I'll stop. Thank you. Thank you.
which I forgot to uh, give Drew the softball. So I said we, we, almost every, almost everywhere, but not not all places. We've stopped short, uh, just disclosing climate change sensitivities, but we have some pioneering groups. One group is in the Central Valley working on CBPSWB planning where they have started to bake climate change into their future no action. You're going to hear allusion to that by Drew. Colorado Basin's our other spot in reclamation. But anyway, so we were grateful for the technical teams in the region of the state for you know, stepping out in that direction. Yep, so Levi summarized that well. Uh, CBP has been a real pioneer in incorporating climate change into our baseline scenario. And I want to talk about why that is. And it's because we're already starting to see the impacts of climate change on our system. So this here is not LTO related work, but some related work that the TSC has done on the pulse temperature control shutters. Uh, these are the system we use to select cold water to do the uh, student temperature. And so we went back through the Central Valley Operations Office records and pulled out the time where we're hitting all shutters open. So this lower level here, right? All these are up to access our coldest water that's available. And so we have about 20 years of data and we broke this out by water year type. And you can see that the time of year that we're utilizing all of our cold water is moving earlier and earlier into the season by about a, a month over the last 20 years. What does this mean? It means we're losing the ability to manage downstream temperatures. Um, and so the CBP is already starting to see the effects of climate change. Um, it's important to emphasize the difference between primary and secondary. Andrew talked very much about quantities and when we're realizing that water, there's a bunch of secondary effects as well, that temperature management and that salinity management. And so, while we're still, while the scientific community is still doing attribution studies on those primary effects, we can see this effect much more strongly in these secondary variables that we're asked to manage to uh, within the CBP project. Uh, and so we can, we can clearly see these trends and we're clearly being affected. Uh, and so there's the potential for more fundamental changes to CBP SWP operations, which is why we're, we're motivated to to bring climate change into our baseline scenarios. So stepping back a little bit more to what Mike highlighted earlier, how is, or how are we seeing this carry through in our precipitation and temperature trends? So you've heard this multiple times, uh, the wets are getting wetter, the drys are getting drier. The net effect of that is that you really see no change in average precipitation through California at least over the historical period. So in particular, right, over the recent history, we've had droughts, we've had wet years, but on average, it, it's netting out, right? If we go to temperature on down, this is where you can start to see a much more distinct signal. Um, so we have our historical average, and then right here, right about 1990, uh, you start to see a significant upward motion in temperatures in the 30 year average. Why is this? Well, one of the hypotheses is that we're starting to see the thermal buffer gets provided by the oceans, start to not be able to absorb as much heat, so that heat has to go somewhere yet. Where is it going? It's going to the atmosphere. That's starting to affect the atmospheric dynamics and all of those processes. Um, that come up into hydrology, evaporation, um, and the running temperatures. Uh, so hopefully this cues up what we're looking at in, in the CBP and SWP. Uh, the core of what I was asked to talk about was how are we carrying this climate information through our model? And this is going to be very similar on the CBP and SWP sides with some subtle variations on, on how that model looks like. So um, I feel like this, this slide is very green. It's been recycled uh, very uh, multiple times. Um, and so we bring climate information into our modeling for our decision makers by our modeling cascade. So we start off at level one with our emission scenarios. Um, these are RCP 4.5, RCP 8.5, 
uh, some reply. Uh, we carry those through then into our climate simulations. Uh, because climate simulations don't typically, uh, uh, aren't typically modeled at resolutions necessary for hydrologic modeling, we go through a downscaling process. We get that down to much finer spatial resolutions and temporal resolutions. This might include some amount of bias correction as well. Then we take that through our hydrologic models. Um, and then we carry that through into our operations. So in the CVP, our primary operations model is the calcium 3 model. Uh, it understands all the constraints on the CVP and S7P systems in terms of regulations, hydrology, uh, salinity standards. Um, and so it determines allocations across those uh, various constraints. And then finally, the output from, from our operations model goes into our secondary modeling suite. These include our salinity models uh, for much finer resolution, it includes those marine temperature models. Um, it also includes our uh, fish life cycle. Um, so you can see that this is sequential modeling. We're sort of cascading down through, and hence that phrase. And as we're moving through this, we're getting finer and finer both spatially. Right. Built in that, at each step, we're making modeling assumptions using engineering judgment. Um, and so we're trying to propagate this climate uncertainty through this modeling cascade under the assumptions for each of these models. And so we have interacting climate and process uncertainty as, as we start to get through these things. All right, what does this look like in reclamations uh, LTO workflow? Uh, so again, this centers on calcium three, right? This is, this is the, the brain, the engine, right? This is what's being used to develop our, our allocations. It models our regulatory, environmental, and contractual constraints. Um, and it includes those groundwater, sea level, and surface hydrology aspects needed to be able to get those solutions. So how is that done? Andrew alluded to this earlier. So we have our historical uh, precipitation and hydrology. Uh, calcium requires a lot of, of information. Uh, it's very challenging to develop wholly new scenarios. For it. And so, Within most of our modeling workflows, we take the historical sequence as a proxy and we apply per perturbations to it, both in temperature and precipitation. Um, so for the LTO workflow, we started with that historical time series and we detrended it to current climate conditions to make 1921 reflect what it would be like if it were. Um, we, we then go over to our climate model. So we uh, select the climate models that are most credibly representative of future climate by looking at their performance over the historical analysis period. We apply a quantile mapping process to develop climate change factors that we can then map back over onto that historical detrimental time series. So now we're taking that current time series and we're bringing in climate information. And that gives us our, our future climate scenarios. Um, so the way calcium operates is it's not a transient model. Right? We're modeling a fixed set of operations uh, under uh, a fixed set of operations, a fixed land use, uh, a fixed sea level condition. And we're using that historical time series to understand how that set of operations would perform across a variety of historical conditions. Uh, and so we're then taking that input time series and we're using those, those fixed constraints to understand how a proposed action or how a potential set of uh, uh, constraints would work. So I mentioned calcium is a very, very hungry model. I want to put this slide up here to clarify because this is our whole modeling workflow that we have to do to generate one climate scenario for, uh, for an analysis. And so this is a very expensive, very time-consuming process. 
Um, we are actively working to improve this. We have some automation under, under work. And in particular, this, this uh, box out here is really where the heavy lift is, where we have to go through and adjust the, the upper basin inflows before bias correction. So through ET modeling. Uh, and so this is hopefully with our, with our partners at DWR going to become a trackable process. Uh, so it's not currently a trackable process, though. Mm -hmm. uh, so this is why we have to be selective in uh, this, the climate scenarios that we are exploring for the LT. Uh, Levi talked about disclosing climate sensitivity. Uh, that's part of this process, in addition to including climate change into our baseline. So our baseline brings our detrended product uh, to our 2022 condition, but then adds to the next 15 years of climate change. Uh, we, are, uh, we have then three sensitivity cases looking at different temperature and precipitation percentiles. We have our hot dry case, uh, this is at the 25th percentile of heat and 75th percentile of uh, temperature. We have our warm wet that reverses those. And then we step forward a little bit uh, to 2040 uh, to look, look at that climate condition as well. So what does this look like in terms of hydrology? So if we take Shasta, this is our big bucket in, in the CVP. Um, you can see that our historical condition here is this dotted line. If we look at just the currently realized uh, climate change from detrending our uh, historical hydrology, that's this black line here. So the thing to note is we still have about the same peak flows, but they're shifting much, right? well, slightly earlier in the season. If we start to impose those future climate conditions on top of that, then you get this blue line, right? And now our peaks have moved back earlier in the season. We go from having a peak here in April, May, to having a peak here in, in March. Um, so we have a limited change in total volume, but this earlier realization of runoff leads to a bunch of operational challenges. So, uh, in particular, right, if I'm trying to hold more storage in the system for later, right, there's more potential for me to have spill in the system. Spill, I'm not able to hold that water, I'm releasing it downstream, I'm gonna forego all the potential uses for that water. This gets more complicated when you start to bring in some of those secondary considerations, right? So one of the ways to, to offset some of these downstream temperature effects would be to have higher carryover. Because under those scenarios, we would, or under drought scenarios, we would have a little bit more protect, protection in the following year. But if I'm getting earlier inflow, if I'm getting more uncertain inflows, now I'm more likely to spill that additional water that I could have used in the previous season. Um, and then, and as I led with, this is all leading to warmer water temperatures uh, as well. And so this is compounding those uh, species management challenges that we have and dip into the salinity standard. Uh, so that's all I have. I just want to do a, a shout out here quick to a climate story map that uh, our Bay Delta office just released. If you want more information around how reclamation is uh, incorporating climate change into the l workflow, you can follow this link and realize it's really not showing up well there at all. Um, but it's a whole Esri-based uh, visualization that talks through uh, how we incorporate bond change into our health care process. Thank you very much. Summarizing that so far. We do have time to have questions now. Um, but I think it's just looking at the magnitude of the challenge of climate change, but also I think it's important to remember what Mike Smith in California is doing things outside of many other states, including my own state, uh, that rely quite heavily on some of the things going on here. So with that, um, Pat, you want to go first and then we'll go to the next. 
Okay. Uh, thanks. Thanks for the presentation. Appreciate that. I, I've got a couple of questions about trying to keep them great. First, it's for John. Um, we, we saw something like this with the zebra and pago mussels coming in the Great Lakes. Mm -hmm. And of course, it took everything out of the water quality yeah. part of the vendors. Uh, but then the Gobi came in, kind of cleaned everything up. Mm -hmm. So, do you see any? Not to you want to introduce Gobi into the system. But uh, you see any ecological thing happening? Yeah, you know, eco the ecological system is always changing, right? And always unexpected things are going to happen. And certainly people have been working on introducing biological control for the water weeds as well. And nothing has really been found that's suitable. Uh, eventually something, either disease or uh, another invader may come in and regulate it. Really, when we make these sorts of ecological decisions, we're, we're really managing in the short term, right? Um, and trying to take care of problems that occur where we have a fairly short window. You, you know, and in this particular window, we have a couple of species and more than a couple of species that are on an extinction spiral. And so there's a certain amount of urgency to solving the problem sooner than later. Um, and we have relatively few tools at our disposal. So yeah, you know, you, you know, it depends on your horizon of concern, right? So. Yeah, I mean, in the long term, uh, that, that doesn't concern us, right? Um, but um, as a follow up, you talked about if there was more variability between the salinity and non salinity yeah. elements, of course, that might be difficult to do over the whole system, but could it be done in a, in a sub element of the system? Why do you kind of well, places like Sassoon Marsh are an ideal place for that to happen. It already does happen to some degree, which is the Sassoon Marsh is located to the west of the legal delta, of course. And, and there, um, there's a sort of, there's a combination of, um, you know, wetlands that are fairly complex geomorphologically and also active management of the system. There's salinity control gates that both monitorate the salinity and control residence time of the water moving through the system. And there are a series of, uh, of independently operated uh, wetlands, essentially. They're, they're managed duck clubs, historically managed for waterfowl, but we're exploring ancillary function of food web benefits. And so um, you know, in a system like that, because you have salinity fluctuation, you have the ability to drain and dry lands and then set it back to a successional, early successional state, and you can manage the rate of water flow across the landscape. There's a lot of tools at, at our disposal in that particular system. Why can we do it there and not in the Delta? Because we're not managing Sassoon Marsh for flood control. And really the problem in the Delta that I see from an ecological perspective is we're managing both for water extraction and for flood control. And so that really impedes the kind of constructive restoration sort of projects that we can uh, implement there. And also the, the, the sorts of measures that would um, limit, increase variability and limit invasivity, I guess you could say. And I mean, I mean, I was telling Jay this the other day, I have this theory of innies and outies, like most of our restoration is, is like innies, you know, we restore habitats that have been marginalized by breaching them, but we don't really have extrusive uh, habitats that we're able to manage in the Delta, things that change the flow of water and change residence time because of flood issues. Thanks. So after these, and then come out. Thanks. Thank you. It's very interesting. Um, I'm trying to, I'm trying to reconcile some of the terminology that we've been using here. So we've got risk and uncertainty, and we've got risk informed something. I didn't write the last word down, but maybe it was risk informed decision making. Then we've got weight of evidence approach. And then we've got primary and secondary effects. And so I think my I think my kind of overall question is for those of you that are doing this analysis, whether it be the world or or on the reclamation side, what are the effects that you're trying to think of? What, is it just volume of water? Is it is it who's gonna benefit from that water? Um, you know. Are there, you have risk, who's bearing the risk? You know, how do different types of uncertainty impact who's bearing that risk? And we've got a lot of these big terms that go around. It makes us sound really like we're on top of it, but I'm now confused about what I'm doing. <laughs> You're because there's an awful lot in most of those terms when you really unpack it. You talked about the DWR, too, right? Yeah. So you had your kind of uncertainty. And you had three points in that cone, right? 
Um, but you didn't talk about the implications or, or, or how somebody could use those three points in that part. Um, can you just tell me, just give me a little bit more. Next just, to, um, just to repeat the question for people who are not involved, is I think that uh, Dr. Lee just asked the question about if we've managed to be used to capture some of the uncertainty and sensitivity within climate and how that fits into the decision making. So, and you, 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 but don't forget that weight of evidence approach because everything else sounded really quantitative, and I could imagine the analysis, and I've got no idea what, what how the weight of evidence approach kind of fits into this hugely analytical framework that the rest of it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I'll, answer, I'll answer it, but let me start. Well. Let me let me start by just saying so we use the CalSIM three model to do all of this analysis, and one of the things that your your question about risks to who and what and who bears these risks uh, is essentially I think handled in and how the model handles priorities, right? So the first thing that the model is going to do is is try to satisfy all of the regulatory requirements. We have to operate the system first. So low regulatory risk, right? Right. I, I think yes. Lower, lower uh, regulatory risk. That's the first thing. And then, you know, and then there's, you know, we're we're, you know, there's flood control elements in the system to the extent that Calcin picks those up. Those are all of the public safety risks, and those things are also in the model. So you know, flood curve, rule curves at reservoirs and how much water you can store. And then it solves for how much water can we move through the system and deliver to our customers. And that is, um, you know, for the delivery capability report, the point of that report is to give our customers information about how much water they should uh, plan for from us in the future. We are a water wholesaler. There's no no uh, uh, duty to serve like a like a, uh, a local water agency where you know I turn on my tap and there better be water. We deliver water according to what nature provides within the within the the, uh, uh, con the constraints of the environment and, and and regulation. So the objective. What's in the objective function for that optimization? In terms of. It's like you said, it's a, it's priority based, really. Um, okay. So those are already baked in. Okay. Baked in. All right. Thank you. Yeah. And and as water delivery agencies, we don't we don't determine our priorities, right? That our priorities come from our regulation, and it comes from our contractual obligations. And so when we're doing a calcium solve, that's what we're looking for. So we're looking for can we meet the regulations, and then once we meet the regulations, can we meet our contractual obligations? So all that logic is included in, in uh, our calcium models. And it calcium, the reason why we have our secondary models is it doesn't include some of the primary features we manage to. Like for reclamation, water downstream water temperatures is a, is a significant concern. Calcium doesn't include that. So there is some iteration that goes back and forth between our, our secondary models and the calcium models to sell <laughs> Well, we have additional cold water that's available. Let's potentially look at maybe making more deliveries in the current current uh, uh, month if we have water available to do that. So, what's, what's the risk? What's the risk of this? So, in the delivery capability report, we look at a number of different. So, I talked about how you know what is the most the, the, the kind of the, the axis of most impact. And we looked at across a number of different metrics yeah. of, of what, how do you measure that, right? So is it SWP deliveries? Is it CVP deliveries? Is it just CVP deliveries south of the Delta? Is it reservoir storage in April? Is it reservoir storage in September? Is it? And we looked at a number of different uh, metrics. We worked with the Bureau across, a, a, you know, we talked about it across a number of experts and it, and it turned out that uh, April to July eight river index, which is just a hydrologic metric, which is not a system managed metric was kind of the keystone metric that like 
really was really good at describing impacts to all these other pieces, and that was a good proxy for risk to the system. We did luck out. I mean, it, it turned out, yeah, because you would, it's snowmelt. It, it picks up snowmelt, it picks up an earlier signal, it picks up, to some extent, the extreme precipitation moving in different parts of the year. Um, yeah, and what you prioritize changes based on the scenario you're looking at. So like for our LTO process, we have, I want to say nearly a dozen different uh, operation scenarios where we're adjusting the priorities amongst those different uh, regulatory constraints and, and operating objectives. We're looking at different uh, amounts of cuts between different um, different contractors and different uh, uh, water use cases to see what that sensitivity is. And so we're taking one of these climate scenarios and applying it to, to many different calcium scenarios to get that understanding about what is that risk? How does that risk change based on how we model it and, and what is potential? So the risk is what's risk? What's the quantity of risk? What's the, the metric for risk? It's uh, how we use water within the CVP, right? So we have risk to our refuges for, for those deliveries. We have risk to our uh, contractors for being able to deliver water. We have uh, endangered species risk, right? And they're all integrated into our modeling flow. And we have to look across all these different types of risk to prioritize. And, and that's where we get feedback from our stakeholders, we get feedback from our regulators to say, how do we prioritize these, these different kinds of risk within a, a CVP SWP system? Thank you so much. Okay. That's really helpful. So, I so, sort of get the way to that part, So no, we'll, we'll move on to other questions. Um, we are going to run into the break a little bit, um, but I think this is really important. So our climate specialist, uh, Mo, uh, would you like to propose? Some yeah, well, thank you all for the insightful yeah. presentations. So my question, well, I have several questions, but maybe the first one, uh, it's mostly to Mike, but uh, also everyone here at the panel. So you showed all these nice results for the changes in interannual variability of precipitation, droughts, and that is kind of like the detection part of it, right? So in the climate community, you have the detection, you have the attribution part. And so the detection is that there is a discernible uh, signal in this particular variable, the attribution is whether we can attribute this to anthropogenic global warming. So I was just wondering if you could talk a little bit about the possibility of attributing those historical changes to global warming, because it's it's very difficult when it gets to like second order variability, like interannual variability. And the reason I'm asking this, it is motivated by some of the uncertainty for the kind of productions. So if we get that part of the attribution correctly, that adds a lot of confidence with some of the uncertainty that we have with the projections, which you pointed out to, as well as in some of the other presentations. Um, okay. Uh, so, I mean, at the trend level, uh, Barnett et al, 2008 in science, we did an analysis of, of detection and attribution um, uh, at the Southwest region scale, uh, including California. Um, and you know, we were able to quantify it. I don't know that's 16 years ago. I don't remember the exact number, but uh, you know, we were able to separate it out as to this much was um, was natural variability and this much was uh, driven by uh, greenhouse gas increases. Um, in terms of what I was showing, I was simply showing you that, that there are changes afoot right now. Um, and actually, the, well, I think I, I think I sort of want to leave it there. Um, attribution is really a nice thing to do. But I got to tell you, I've seen it doesn't make a goddamn bit of difference to most engineers. 
Um, I don't care where it comes from, right? We're still managing to that month already. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, I, I mean flat-footed, but I, I honestly, um, I'm not sure I can answer your question offhand. Yeah, no, that, that really helps. Well, I guess the, the other part of why I asked it, Peter, may I ask this, or are we short of the time? Please go ahead, oh, yeah. and then we'll take Jared's question, and then we'll take it for you. Okay. It's just because when you look at the uncertainty projections, this at least helps with giving confidence for the sound of change if you have that to be more. Mm -hmm. So I guess that's why I was asking that question. Uh, but then you all showed like how you're dealing with the quantum projections and the uncertainty envelope, which seems to be quite large. So are you looking at some specific practices or maybe uh, narrowing down that uncertain uncertainty envelope? Mm -hmm. uh, what do you think about maybe restraining these using observations. Um, and again, all of these questions, just here in front of me, I'm looking at two figures from the national, the fifth national climate assessment for observed changes in precipitation in the UN and projected changes. And they are totally different for, for California. So again, yeah. reconciling observations and projections. So on that. I may just jump in real quick. Um, and it ties to Denise's question on or question on weight of evidence. Um, really, it's a matter of we're trying to pivot from just defining possible hazards, climate change scenarios, to hazards we expect or feel are likely to occur. And so the thought idea we're trying to promote, at least in reclamation, is uh, don't just take the climate projections as this ensemble of opportunity. Uh, apply your scrutiny and marry up uh, climate science theory, uh, put on your observational blinders and ignore the theory, ignore the model, what are the observations saying, and synthesize all together. And where you have alignment on changes that you're seeing, that has greater weight than where you don't. So as example, warmer air, warmer water, sea level rise, that's well aligned because you can don't have to look at observations or the climate projections. You can go back to the history of theory where we're at now you would expect to get warmer. Okay, you look at the observations, we're seeing it get warmer. Look at the climate projections, well, four generations of IPCC have more or less said the same thing. Great alignment, but regional precipitation change, no observation, no modeling. We don't have strong theory on how the, the extra tropical jet stream should drift north or south as we see global warming. Observationally, it's pretty inconclusive. Uh, climate projections, Mike said it well, the, the story, ebbs and flows a bit through the IPCC generations. And so there is maybe a signal in the latest generation of IPCC, but it's not under, it's not corroborated by a more con a convincing theoretical story or observational record. So that should be regarded differently than the warming story. But getting people to culturally pivot to that is really uncomfortable. And, and you, if you'll call, I said, uh, we did a climate selection for the LTO process. And so for that, we use the historical reanalysis period as a means to constrain the, the future models, right? We looked and said, which of the models over the historical reanalysis period was capturing that interannual variability. So we explicitly looked at transition risk between wet dry years to say which ones are skillful over the historical period and are therefore more likely to be skillful Future period. And so we did try to constrain that to some extent as well. Yeah, just real quickly, um, as you know, if you look at the, at the you, you said sort of broad uncertainty or broad scatter among the models and the projections. Obviously, if you look at the temperatures, you know, it's you know, many standard, well, three or four standard deviations about from the historical mean by end of century, so that, you know, the you're talking about a rather large I uh, that in terms of precipitation, as you, you know, as I said, as you said, you know, total precipitation, yes, it it uh, is a band that gets thicker and wider, but uh, more or less straddles no change as you go forward. But when you split it into extreme precipitation versus everything else, you also see a cloud, if you will, that goes up and actually leaves. The norm so that with your eyeball you can see it to go back to that test which i think is actually you know one of the more secure ones is you ought to be able to see the changes 
that's but so that I would sort of dispute to an extent the uh, proposition that our bands are just are just way too broad to know what's going on, even in the even in the uh, projections or in frankly uh, a lot of the historical observations. Yeah, no, totally if you're taking apart it apart into on the variable, so theoretical. Well, if you take it apart into its theoretical yeah. base right. parts. Big storms, I'm sorry to tell you, are not the same animals as normal storms. They're just not. Yeah. And I, you I have think to break them yeah. up or else you get this scatter of stuff. And and one of the stories is right, the thermodynamic effect of, yeah. of temperature warming right. versus the dynamical effect on climate, yeah. you know, systems. And so we can what some of the I glossed over how we're getting at these scenarios, but we're, you know, we're using a, a, a synthetic weather generator that we can change the temperature and, and, and explore the thermodynamic effect and hold the, the dynamic fixed at this point until we have more information about how dynamical changes are occurring and are affecting California. At that point, we have the dial built into our, our general weather generator, weather regime based weather generator to be able to, to modify that. But we like, we just don't feel like we have the the certainty at this point. We certainly do on temperature, but not on on the dynamical show. Can I just ask, with the synthetic generator, have you got a mechanism for feeding that into CalSim three, which is where the rubber hits the road? That's what we're building right now. So, <laughs> DWR and Reclamation are sort of uh, we we are joined at the hip in terms of our our climate work. So this we, is we the take, highest priority yeah, right now. I think. We, uh, and Cal and Calcic. We take the best science from the, each uh, uh, other's previous study, and every time we do an application, we're trying to advance that. So one of our learnings is we need to be, have this workflow highly automated, so we can we can build through to Calcic, and so that's one of the things we're tackling right now. But but you're right. So that the Calcic scenarios right now are shackled to the historical sequence of events. Those the sequences of events get more extreme within the year and the total year itself, but- At the monthly level. Just at the monthly level. Well, at the daily level, and then it gets aggregated yeah. up to the monthly level before it goes into calcium, so you're right. Um, but yeah, it's a very high priority for us to, to unshackle it from the historical sequence and be able to put in synthetic sequences of events and drops. And stuff. Uh, uh, and just last, last point. So yeah, thank you so much. This helped a lot. So for both DWR and Bureau folks, you showed in your work workflow you have uh, emission scenarios as part of the selection. And I was just wondering whether you consider running most of these simulations as a function of global warming level, which now it's kind of like the standard approach used both in IPCC R6 as well as the fifth natural climate assessment, just because the climate sensitivity of the models is a huge factor in the uncertainty. So is this something you're working on or is it already there but they have missed it? So we, we treat RCP 4.5 and 8.5 as equally probable. Okay. Um, and so when we're generating our TNP factors, that goes into that as well. Um, if, if you look at future projections, it's going to be most recently, I want to recall somewhere around six is about where things are, are coming in. So splitting the difference between 4.5 and 8.5 sort of gets you, gets you about right there. And I would say our approach with our weather generator is more analogous to a global warming approach because we're telling it how much temperature to apply at the boundary based on the consensus of the models at a given time frame. So. Thanks. Okay. Well, thanks. Um, a quick question to yeah. take us into the break. Hopefully. So it's for Drew. It's a workflow question. Uh, I think you had the slide that starts out with uh, mission scenarios, I think, and then down to uh, impacts of the bay. Um, and the last two steps were CalSAM and then impacts on the bay. Simulation. So the question is motivated by what we heard from uh, Kenny Rose and their review of uh, various models and so on. One of the comments was that going from CalSim at a daily time step to much shorter time steps for the uh, 
estrogen mm -hmm. simulation, so the time steps at which fish react and not even after the so needed uh, be addressed. It was monthly for calcium, mm -hmm. right? The calcium. Monthly time steps, yes. <laughs> so, so anyway, I wonder if you, how you would react to that uh, or how you do it now. Is that, you know, is there a characterization mm -hmm. correct? And are you looking at kind of other uh, approaches? So, so I will caution my response in that I'm not a Delta modeler, um, but typically if we need to have finer resolutions on, on time scales coming out of calcium, we'll do a disaggregation process to, it, it depends on the model. Um, on the temperature side, we use a model called HEC5Q with a, with a preprocessor. We've looked at that uh, on how that compares but, uh, between the um, disaggregated and an actual hourly aggregated up to the monthly then uh, disaggregated. And they're actually comparable in terms of the temperature performance. Um, so certainly if, if the model requires disaggregation, that, that's typically what's done after the calcium setups. There's also one coupling that says there's an emulator of the estuary model in calcium that's been around for decades <clears throat> based on a artificial neural network, love them or not, but it emulates the, the complex DSM-2 simulation. Uh, so you'll have the Delta sort of behavior at a monthly time step. So there is some coupling compatibility there. Uh, it's not clean, but it, it's there. And I'll let the DWR folks talk about it because they, they built it. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's, like I said, it's an emulator. So sort of the nuance of the daily scale is interpreted by that neural network. And, and so what we, the only thing we kind of commit to is saying we, we provide the volumes that we think are necessary to meet the standards and such. And, and then, you know, you can then disaggregate that monthly volume how you need to. Like we've had techniques where we map to historic, like we'll, we have the historic record. We find months that are the most similar to the simulated month in terms of a volume and time of the year and things like that. And then we take a, a, a hydrograph from the historic record that's daily and then we map that you know to that monthly volume feed that into our delta models and then then that'll go down even to a 15 minute time scale and that ann is trained by having multiple, by having that information yeah multiple simulations at that finer resolution mm -hmm. that can be used to train that and then pass that information in yeah, for a course of time you know that new model made it into that review report that anybody else knows and just a point of clarification, what we're talking about here is all of these planning and projection studies on an operational basis, we would use daily observational data and, and not monthly. So, monthly. so maybe that's the difference. Maybe they would talk about that. That's right. So I'd like to uh, draw this session to a close. Um, I'd like to thank all of the panelists for coming and uh, fielding our questions and for the people's presentations. So, what I'd like to ask is everyone just take a five minute break, come back at 3 20, and uh, let's thank the panelists once more. Thank you. Oh, sorry. Great time. Mine.
Okay, if folks uh, take a seat, please. <laughs> Come back for the last session of the day. Oh, <laughs> well, welcome back to the last session of the day, which is the where we're going to hear from a series of the uh, environmental NGOs working on issues from the Bay Delta, uh, as well as the Watershed in the Delta. We'll follow the same format where I'll give a brief background of each of our panelists. Um, and then I'll read out the order at the end of that because uh, they organized amongst themselves with a reasonable sequence. Uh, it will be slightly different to the one published on the agenda. From Gary Bocker, uh, well known to many, is the senior policy director at Friends of the River where he oversees the work of technical and policy experts, consultants, and he works to implement a strategic and comprehensive approach to re restoring California's river and other aquatic ecosystems. From 1992 to 2024, he was a program director at the Bay Institute, where he played a leadership role in negotiating the historic agreement to restore flows and fisheries to the deep watered San Joaquin River. Um, and uh, all of the various aspects that goes with that. Barry Nelson is with the Golden State Salmon Association. He's the owner of Western Water Strategies and serves as a consultant on many California water issues, particularly the Golden State Salmon Association. He was the director and co-director of NRDC's California Water Program for many years. He also served as the first executive director to save San Francisco Bay Association. He has served for more than a decade as a commissioner and alternate commissioner on the Bay Conservation and Development Commission. Uh, he received, uh, or was a graduate of UC Berkeley with degrees in both economics and rhetoric. Ashley Overhouse is with the Defenders of Wildlife. She's the water policy advisor and engages on a variety of issues statewide, including water deliveries, water rights, the enforcement of environmental laws to protect wildlife that rely on a healthy San Francisco Bay Delta estuary and Central Valley wetlands. She currently serves on Friends of the Rivers Board of Directors and is the current board chair of the Central Valley Joint Venture. Prior to joining Defenders in 2022, she worked on water policy and land use at Friends of the River. The Hydropower Reform Coalition, the South Yuba River Citizens League, uh, Shuk Mahali and Weinberger, and the Governor's Office. She graduated from UC Santa Cruz and also holds a JD from the University of California College of Law, San Francisco. Uh, most of us remember it as UC Pistons. She also holds a Master's of Law from the University of London, specializing in water policy. Dr. Ann Willis is the California Regional Director for American Rivers. Previously, she led a research program at the UC Davis Center for Watershed Sciences, where she worked closely with many NGOs, state and federal agencies, private landowners to guide watershed scale conservation strategies. Prior to that, she worked in the private sector with the US Army Corps of Engineers. Her work focused on rivers throughout California's Central Valley, North Coast, and the climate. And finally, on today's panel, we have uh, Dr. Julie Zimmerman with the Nature Conservancy. She's the Director of Science for the Nature Conservancy's California Water Program based in Sacramento. She's worked in the system for over 20 years, focusing on developing collaborative science-based approaches to water management and river restoration. Before joining TNC, Julie was a science coordinator for the Central Valley Project Improvement Act for fish programs with the US Fish and Wildlife Service, specializing in environmental flows, water operations, and the development of decision support tools for river restoration. 
And prior to that, she was with the Nature Conservancy's Kinetic and Melbourne Program and the Chesapeake Bay Program. She received her PhD from the University of Minnesota and also holds an expert certification in decision analysis from the National Conservation Training Center. So with that, I think it's important to have these uh, introductions uh, and the level of experience of people we're hearing from. And so we're going to go through in this in a slightly different order. Uh, let's see, Dr. Zimmerman with the Nature Conservancy will start, followed by Gary Bobka, Friends of the River, and then Ann Willis with American Rivers, and then Barry Nelson, and then Ashley Overhouse will do the wrap up for the NGOs. So with that, uh, well, this might come up on this. You need to bring her on advance of the slide. I know, there's two remotes here. I'm just looking to see what's going on. Let's use this. Oh, okay. Okay, okay. Well, thanks everyone for having me here. Um, I'm Julie Zimmerman with the Nature Conservancy, and I am going first because I'm going to take kind of a bigger picture view of the system and talk about salmon recovery more generally and flows. Yeah, there is. Oh, okay. Give me a second while I figure this out. Why do you want to make sure? There we go. No, I, I got it. Thanks. <laughs> so, salmon populations in the Central Valley are declining, and we all know that that's happening. Um, what we're doing for managing salmon isn't working. So that's the place where I'm coming from from this conversation is we put a lot of effort into management. We usually manage the system very tightly. We know it's over allocated. We know we take a very reductionist approach where we're, turn, we're fine tuning knobs at individual parts of the watershed and it's not working. Part of it is because we have this over allocation of water and then you layer that on top of that climate change, we have more extreme and more frequent droughts, floods, wildfires, and there's just no flexibility. Our systems are at the breaking point and Salmon are suffering, but so, you know, it's hard to reliably deliver water. It's hard to really see any species that are thriving. And so the question is, how do we introduce some more space so that we can look at recovery, some more flexibility, some resilience to all of these changes? This is a, a graph that you've probably seen just looking at spring run and the doubling period or the, the doubling period average and just how it's gone down over time. Winter run and spring run have really um, been the two salmon runs that have really suffered the most because you know we don't have as much of hatchery input as we do for fall run. But overall, I'm gonna focus more on salmon and more on the upstream part of the system. That's where my background is. And, um, and we know that it's in trouble. We know that Flow is really the important issue. Flow is the master variable. It mediates temperature, it mediates water quality. It supports all ecosystem function. It also creates habitat. We've gotten into this discussion in most of these processes where we end up in these debates of flow versus habitat. I feel like they can't be separated. Flow creates habitat. When you go in with a bulldozer and you change habitat in one space, one part of the system, you can't expect it to have systemic effects, right? If you improve flow, you're going to have a bigger picture improvement. You're going to have increased habitat throughout the system. It's just the only way you can scale up. I've really struggled with this for years because I was working on CVPIA and habitat restoration projects. And whenever you go into a river, I've worked on the American River extensively, also on the Stanislaus, and you think about what can I do with, you know, even a million dollars in a year? Maybe you can create five acres of, off, of um, well, not even floodplain habitat, but some side channel or, or you know, spawning habitat. What you're really doing though over time is you're trying to create a miniaturized river system, right? Like you're taking all this water out and then you have this long river and you're saying, well, now I need to change it so that the structure of it will function with you know, half the flow or 30% of the flow. So you're trying to recreate it. 
and we just can't do it. We don't have the money to do it. We don't have the tools to do it. We don't have the time to do it. So flow is really the only way that you can do this over the large scale. We know that salmon respond really strongly to flow. We've had a lot of new papers published over the past 10 years. I can provide references, although you probably already have a lot of these. This figure is from a paper done uh, that came out of the Nip Science Center. This is uh, Cyril Michelle led this one. The two panels on the left, D and G, show response winter to, of winter run on the top and fall run on the bottom to changes in flow, changes in survival with respect to flow. And on the right is looking at spring upwelling. So what this paper really showed is that flow has more of an effect on salmon survival than ocean conditions. This is another kind of argument we get into in the system is, you know, is it ocean conditions? Is it this? Is it that? What we can do is pick out the effects of flow. It's really hard to do this work because we can't manage the system experimentally, right? We have to wait for large, good water years to really look at effects. So it's really difficult to get enough of those years to really find an effect. So these are really important papers to look at. I have been in a lot of conversations where people say, well, we've tried to add additional water to the system and it hasn't worked. And if you think about it, maybe we're looking at the difference between 42% of unimpaired and 40% of unimpaired, right? It's like these minute changes because we just don't have the flexibility to really look at improvements. And what we need to see are big improvements that an ecosystem is actually going to respond to. You can't just put a tiny bit of extra water down and expect to see a change in a system as variable as this. So what I've been working on with a whole lot of collaborators is trying to come up with a better approach. And this is based on the idea of functional flows, where there are pretty common hydrographs for rivers throughout California that have certain parts of the hydrograph that support ecological function. And even though we're looking at single species management, I would argue that the reason why we're not seeing improvements in single species is because we're not supporting ecological processes. So you can't pick out a single life stage in a single species and see a difference unless you're supporting river processes more generally. So we came up with something called the California Environmental Flows Framework, which is really a set of tools. There's a technical report. There's a website. There's a set of modeling tools that are based on the idea of functional flows. The Nature Conservancy hosts a tool where you can go into any river segment in California and you can download monthly unimpaired, predicted or estimated monthly unimpaired flows for any month from 1950 to the present, and then also functional flow metric predictions. The, met the functional flow metrics describe these five functional flow components that you see here. The dry season base flow when we're not getting any rain in California, the full pulse, which is that kind of first response or first flush where you get the first um, storms. Winter base flow, where you have just this higher kind of baseline flow that really supports spawning and, and other processes. But winter pulse flows, we looked at the two, five, and 10 year pulse flows. So not the huge floods, but just those pulses. And then the spring recession, where you have that transition from the wet season to the dry season. And our metrics describe each of these in terms of magnitude, duration, frequency, and then for the spring recession rate of change. So our argument is that you would have to restore these functional flow components to really see outcomes in any freshwater species that are resilient and persistent. They would improve all species. So again, it's not just looking at salmon in particular, but for salmon to be able to survive, you have to support river function. We did this because even with all the information we're getting about flow targets and thresholds, they're still really hard to implement system-wide. So we're seeing, you know, you, you salmon do better if you achieve a specific flow at a specific place on the main stem Sacramento River, for example. But then what do you do in Mill Creek or what do you do in the Tuolumne and what do you do for other times of the year? So this approach is meant to give us somewhere to start for all any time of the year, any river, and we have the modeling predictions to help do that. 
the question now is how do you implement it in a specific place, especially somewhere as complex as the Central Valley? And I have a couple of examples. This is one that I wasn't involved in, but Ann Willis and Jay Len, so many, several people in this room were working on this, which is taking the functional flow components and looking at them as a, a way to manage a water budget. So this is an example of taking 40% of unimpaired flow on the Tuolumne River. Instead of saying, what would you implement from the reference conditions for these flow components, which is what we would recommend if you wanted to achieve really resilient salmon populations, what could we do with a specific volume of flow? And so this takes that 40% of unimpaired and says, here's how you might manage that in the system. Another example that I have is a project I am involved with, um, which is co-equal. So uh, this is part of a grant to the UCs um, pretty much almost all of them, I think. It's a pretty big project where we're looking at water management in the Central Valley and trying to look at alternative scenarios of operations with different climate inputs using calcium. So one of the problems we have is that calcium is our tool. It's very difficult to run. There aren't that many people who do it. You can't just say, let me explore this scenario of different types of operations and get an output and be able to analyze it easily. So what we're doing here is coming up with a whole range of scenarios and looking at the effects of um, on drinking water, salinity, and salmon. We're using functional flows both as an input, so we're creating some scenarios to run in calcium using a functional flows approach, and then we're also evaluating the outcomes based on functional, uh, functional flows. So it's embedded into this. This is led by Ted Grantham at Berkeley and it's supposed to be done in September of 2025. Um, there's a lot of information on it too, if anybody's interested. So that's all I have. I just wanted to set the stage to have an argument for a systems-wide approach. I think we need to introduce resilience back in the system if we hope for a good outcome. And um, my colleagues will expand on that a bit, but thank you. So I'm going to bounce around on a few random, more random things here. Uh, really, uh, but uh, let me start by just giving a little overview. I want to talk um, about multiple stressors uh, in the case of urban smell. Uh, I want to talk about um, the scale of uh, restoration and protection uh, on the ecosystem level. And I want to talk about the baseline solutions for how we manage the agencies. species. Um, so I want to start by just making a general comment about multiple stressors. Um, you know, Julie just now and John Rosenfield this morning talked a lot about flow. My community tends to focus on flow because uh, in regarded as a driver of ecological condition and as a barrier, a master variable that that interacts with and has synergistic effects with all of the important attributes. Uh, of the ecosystem, um, and also because it is the one most resistant to uh, management of food because of social gaming and political issues. Um, and uh, so it's important that it, receive, that it receive attention, but that does not mean that uh, it is the uh, it is a panacea for, for our community or that it's the only uh, actually of uh, multiple stressors uh, are at the heart of the kind of approaches that we tend to pursue. Uh, NGOs also work on um, 
habitat restorations, contaminant um, reduction, et cetera, we see it as all, it's not in either or, and that's really important. Um, and nowhere uh, are multiple stressors more important than in the case of dog smell, which is um, kind of the odd child of the Big Delta estuary. You know, it's a lot easier to make some broad generalizations about a number of the other aquatic organisms. Uh, Delta smells seem to uh, enjoy being the, uh, the, odd, the odd species out. Um, and you've heard, you know, we thought we talked a, a little about that. I think Sam touched on that this morning. Um, Sam and Sean Acuna from Met, who's in the audience, and I um, uh, were part of a group that has been working on trying to figure out uh, the most promising approaches to uh, reversing the trend toward extinction of Delta smell. Um, it's a process that was um, it's a multi uh, interest party, uh, federal and state agencies, water users, NGOs, academics working on a structured decision making uh, process over the last few years. Um, I'm not here speaking to them formally, but I, I think it's important that you be aware that uh, that work is coming to a head. The final report will be issued at the end of this month. Um, and it's pretty interesting, um, print some pretty interesting results that stress that. For delta smelt, there's you know as you would expect, there's no magic bullet, uh, and that arguments over whether we should increase habitat or influence flows uh, are sterile arguments that don't really lead anywhere. Uh, in fact, what uh, this SDM process seems to indicate is that we need to do a number of different things, and that there are synergistic effects that are created when we do those things. Um, the SDM process used. Four different models, four different life history models. Uh, the, the individual life history model that based on Ken Rose's work, uh, uh, the Fish and Wildlife Services uh, life history model, uh, and the revised version of the Wander the Rizzo model, and a limiting factors analysis based model from Hamilton and Murphy uh, to try and, you know, and wh whether any of those the results of them were were true is arguable, but they're all pretty suggestive. Uh, and what they demonstrated is that you get the best effects uh, when you improve habitat, increase food production, improve flow conditions, and that together, uh, those are more likely to lead to recovery than any of those individual actions. Maybe not surprising, but good uh, to know that the models bear that. Um, and that the recovery of delta smelt is possible if you pursue these actions together. Uh, and there are seven actions that were recommended as next steps so that we can start to test um, if we in increase habitat, uh, tidal habitat, can we actually boost food production and will it actually subsidize um, productivity for smelt? Um, can we reshape uh, outflows in a way that uh, also increases food availability, et cetera, et cetera. So they're listed here. Um, a lot of detail in the report that's coming out at the end of the month. Um, I want to emphasize that you know the the some things perform better than others. So food pumping food production definitely was the best result they got, and increasing tidal marshes on a large scale on a large scale uh, really made a difference. However. Our confidence that we're going to get the results from tidal marsh restoration in terms of actually food subsidies for delta smell, um, the confidence in that isn't as high as some other actions. Whereas uh, if we improve outflows, um, we know that we're going to get um, uh, increased uh, abundance for, so we're going to get good results for smell. We, the models show that we will get increased abundance, not at the same rate as food production, but there's a higher level of confidence that we'll actually get abundance increases because of those manipulations. So the idea is that we need to move forward with a number of actions and test them to see how do we manipulate them. In other words, how do we improve flows in different ways to see what kind of bump we'll get? How do we do that in combination with beginning to increase tidal marsh acreage? What are the synergistic effects? Uh, where does that lead? Um, there's nothing that came out of this that suggests that if we only pursue one investment strategy, that it's going to pay off. We need to do them all. Huh? Moving, moving backward uh, here. Does my external display that I'll give you a bit of 
Meanwhile, uh, so the next thing I want to talk about is um, scale. Um, I think about another five or six minutes. Yeah. So, um, so I'm going to use slow as an example. You could use this. I think you could use habitat um, acreage and and complexity as another example. Um, but I'll focus on flow. Um, so we've heard a lot of discussion about flow as a driver of condition. Um, we need to think about the scale of flow alteration um, in, in this system because of the political and operational restraints. Uh, we tend to uh, change flows in relatively minor ways compared to the uh, uh, overall scale of flow versus, versus diversion. Um, what we do know is that the more flow there is, uh, generally the better the biological response. In some cases, it seems to be a pretty straight continuous curve. Uh, one of Wim's, uh, one of my favorite um, slides from Wim uh, that covers a bunch of species that display some sort of, most of them display some sort of continuous curve. For other species, it's more of a sort of a step function. Um, famous uh, slide from uh, Starock et al. showing that um, in drier conditions, you don't get much recruitment, but then above a certain level, well, we, we start to see um, uh, pretty dramatic uh, increases in, uh, in the numbers uh, of returning salmon. Um, here's an, uh, an example, a recent example from uh, looking at like surgeon flows where um, below 30,000 CFL in, uh, in Sacramento, you don't get the bump, but then all of a sudden when you cross that threshold, you start to see um, where the flow arises. And the point here uh, is not that increasing flow is a solution to everything. The point here is that in order to get away from simply managing to delay extinction, we need to do things that increase positive population growth in dramatic ways. And so in this system, what that means is that you have to consider flow improvements on a much larger scale than we generally do. Otherwise, you have a system like this. This is, uh, I think John showed a version of this this morning. Um, and the main takeaway here is that in terms of the amount of water that goes through the whole system and reaches San Francisco Bay, we are creating extreme drought conditions in nearly, nearly half the time. So the opportunities except in exceptionally wet years for populations to rebound is extremely limited. So we can, we can take around the edges of solutions that uh, deal with uh, uh, entrainment at the pumps or you know, preventing the total disappearance of habitat in very dry years. But we don't change this situation and create uh, flow and habitat opportunities for rebounding populations. Um, we're gonna lose in the, in the long term. Um, so the final thing I wanted to focus on in my sort of miscellany here um, is the other end. <laughs> Not the, the opportunities for growth by enhancing flow and habitat, but by what we're assuming about what happens when things get bad. Uh, in, in dry years, populations are going to suffer. That's natural. Um, there are things that we can do to prevent uh, loss or extreme degradation in those years. Um, but in designing solutions, you have to take into account the fact that not only is the existing base, existing protections don't work. Everybody agrees that our, our flow and diversion controls aren't good enough in the driest years. Um, and and I won't go into that. And, and I have some thoughts about why some proposed solutions aren't very good that um, that I'm happy to chat with you later about. Um, but in the absence of clear rules about what we do when we have droughts, um, what happens is that we either do adaptive management, which is maladaptive, meet and confer stuff where people just get together and talk about things, but there is no. Uh, mandate to really do anything, and we tend to be paralyzed by uncertainty, or we just waive the rules. You need to be aware that six out of 10 of the last 10 years, the state of California waived the rules, water quality standards and, and endangered species protections in some cases. And that was it. 
Now, we're, we're going to experience extreme droughts. They're going to get worse. Climate change is a problem. But we know it's coming. Drought years are not new. Um, we can anticipate those conditions and be clear and transparent about what the rules are and make sure that we're sharing resources among the environment and other uses. We don't do that now. We give a get out of jail free card. And if you're thinking about how it is that the federal project or the larger system should be managed in order to, to avoid extinction and promote recovery, you have to keep that in mind. And you have to have solutions that actually detail how you adaptively manage under the worst conditions and how you deal with the loss of rules. Uh, how do you anticipate that? What is it that you provide in terms of resources and guidance to deal with those situations? Um, so I will leave you with this one thought, um, and that is that, you know, the discussions about solutions to Bay Delta's problems and the needs of endangered species often run into the constraints of impacts, economic impacts, water supply impacts. Concerns about those impacts are totally legitimate. However, they are not constraints on identification of what the science tells us what the solution should be. And I think that you have to be very careful about making assumptions about what is feasible, politically acceptable. That's not your job. Your job is to say what the solutions are. And yes, identify potential um, feasibility issues, but essentially, what is it that would work to restore the system and put endangered species on the road to recovery? Um, and then decision makers have the information that they need. They don't choose to use it. That's that's on that, not new. Thanks. Thanks, Gary. I am. No slides at all. <laughs> and I'll... Just working without a net. <laughs> I do have notes. I am so impressed at how far somebody can drive backwards in one day. <laughs> that is. <laughs> well. No, I'm just trying to figure out if there's a door we could close. <laughs> 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 yeah. 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 It's impressive. Well, thank you for having me. Um, I don't really know how to jump off of where you ended, except to say I, I've been giving a lot of thought today about what to do when you need to make decisions when knowledge is always changing. I was asked to come here to speak a little bit about the environments and the role that these projects have on the environments, also about my background in studying stream temperature and how I manage it from reservoirs and there are papers. I'm not going to go into a lot of detail on it, but um, I think there are some really good lessons from that work that tie into some of the talks that others have given here today. And when I Think about making decisions when knowledge is changing. I think about my first job at the Army Corps of Engineers where I was asked to look at the impacts of climate change on flood control curves. Um, Levi probably doesn't remember me, but he did some modeling for me and I used it. So thank you for my master's. <laughs> um, and the one point that really sticks out to me is that, you know, we think about how much data we do we need. Do we need 80 years? Well, we thought we needed 50 years. Isn't 50 years of data enough? It seems like it until you realize you used 50 years of the wettest years you had. But what are you supposed to do? You need to make some decisions. The work around environmental flows and environmental water quality is changing, and I would say equally as rapidly. We're in a we're in a state of constant discovery, which is exciting and also makes folks like your jobs incredibly challenging. For flow research, I really think back to the late 90s when this concept of the natural flow regime was finally named. I think people understood it. It was a little more intuitive, but it was named. Um, and so we started to think about it and think about, well, how do we make our rivers healthy if they need this natural flow regime? Is it a minimum flow? Well, that hasn't been working. Is it a percent of flow? Also not working. <laughs> Is it functional flows? If somebody would do them, we might see whether or not they would work. 
And I think they have a solid chance that actually both intuitively and we're starting to see empirically make the most sense to me. Um, stream temperature research is really similar. We've always known that temperature is important. Um, and the work on stream temperature has evolved really quickly, but it's about a decade behind where we are with flow regimes. Um, we have really only started to let go of this idea of managing the temperature thresholds and recognize the importance of temperature regimes, the seasonal patterns of temperature in the river, how they change their magnitude, their frequency, all of the elements that Julie was identifying for functional flows. So we have a lot of knowledge, but there are some real constraints. Some of them are real, real. Some of them are political real, but among those constraints are things like our water right system. It's a reality check between what we're saying we need in rivers and what we can actually put into rivers today. Some constraints are real and constructed at the same time. We've constrained our river channel so that even if we wanted to release functional flows, we couldn't because they don't have the space. And we're learning that we can't miniaturize our rivers. I loved that phrase that you use and still get the same kind of ecological function out of them. Those are real constraints. Um, there are other real constraints. You know, Steve Lindley this morning was talking about the importance of headwater habitat and Mike Dettinger was mentioning that as well. Um, but we can't get to it. Well, we can, but the creatures that need to move through the rivers to get to it can't. And what we are learning now is that this infrastructure system that we've built is incapable of replicating these natural patterns that we need specifically for water temperature. We can release patterns and magnitudes of flow, but we have not been able to identify a single reservoir in California that can replicate natural thermal regimes. That's a huge limitation. And I think the implications are profound because what are you supposed to do when every major artery is dammed? And the ones that we've been relying on for backup are being impaired by things like wildfires, even as we speak. There's also some really, I think, difficult um, shifting baselines that are going to challenge our ability to recover these systems, um, not least of which the rivers themselves are changing. You know, I learned on a river trip with Albert recently about some of the exciting research they did. And um, I'm sure you've, he's shared that rivers that have now been reliably perennial are now ephemeral. What are we to do when the function of the river itself, the fundamental function of the river itself no longer exists in an unimpaired world because of climate change? It means that changed hydrology may no longer support the ecosystems that we are trying to recover, particularly those, as Mike pointed out, in the Sacramento Basin, where under some emission scenarios, there is no more snow but we have entire ecosystems that have evolved where the key period of time is the snowmelt recession. Those are huge and profound implications. Well, all of this makes me think of a talk I actually heard in February, 2022. It was when the latest sets of IPCC reports were being released and as scientists who were notoriously terrible about communicating science, we were all being gathered by the editors of different chapters so that we could identify our three main takeaways. Um, and that was a really powerful meeting for me because I sat there and uh, one of the editors of the water chapter said, okay, if you're doing your public messaging, these are the consistent messages we want you to deliver. There's three takeaways. One, there's no good news. And I was like, is that science? <laughs> <laughs> Two is that we were locked into climate change for the next 30 to 50 years. Even if we did everything that we know we needed to do starting today, it takes that long before we would see a bend in the curve. And that was a really grave moment for me. I, have, I felt despair and I really wondered what I was doing. What am I doing? But the third one was, but there's still a chance and we know what we need to do. That was a real call to action for me. And so in the spirit of that IPCC talk, I similarly have some takeaways. One is to really just ground yourself, ourselves in the power of now, not just that we have an opportunity to do something now, but to think about the power we're actually wielding. When we think about the Central Valley, 
you know, these rivers, their birth started 10 million years ago when the Nevado Plano got its first little crack in it, when two tectonic plates ran into each other and water started slowing, slowly going down, the smallest downhill there was. About six million years ago, that's when salmon showed up, at least the salmon as we know them. You know, they were here a lot longer than that, but the ancestral modern day salmon showed up then. Two and a half million years ago, ice age. 10,000 years ago, humans. 150 years ago is when we can start dating back our evidence of climate change. That means in 150 years, we have found a way to wield immense power that is literally outpacing the fundamental forces of the earth. And we're the ones who get to make the decision about how we change, how we use that power. My second takeaway is that the stakes are high and they're especially high for us in California. Uh, California is such a special place. Um, I love California so much. Um, you know, as we know, it's a global, global biodiversity hotspot that no place else in North America mimics. Um, but it is also within the contiguous US, the site of the most biodiversity loss in the nation. That's painful to recognize. But takeaway number three is that there's still a chance and we know what to do. And I think the key has been alluded to in a number of different talks. You know, we, we think about our history of water use, which has really been power over, power over rivers, power over drought, power over environment. But if we can reframe our thinking into power with and align some of our solutions with these fundamental forces of the earth, then we're creating something that's not just resilient, but that brings longevity and stability to the environment and to people. So what do we need to do? Part of that alignment right now is to not just think about the long-term impacts and trajectory, but what we can do right now to build that bridge until the broader recovery manifests itself through the decisions we make. So focusing on places like groundwater dominated watersheds like the Feather River, which will be a climate refugia, spring fed streams, which are biodiversity hotspots and climate resilient, um, rethinking like Mike was talking about, not just managing for valley floors, but starting at the very top at our headwaters so that all of that can build and accumulate value that then goes downstream. And by being really smart about things that we need to keep and things that we don't and making the recommendations we need to ensure the pieces we have remain in place until we get an opportunity to choose more of the things we want. So that's it. My last takeaway is really about the power of collaboration. And I think that was something Sam Luomo was talking about this morning, this fear of the fracturing of collaboration amongst people. But I would encourage people to think more broadly and think it's not just about collaborating amongst ourselves. It's about collaborating with the environment too. Thank you. Coming up or? Yeah. Uh, so again, I'm Barry Nelson. I work for the Golden State Salmon Association and just a brief introduction to GSFA. Uh, GSSA doesn't call itself a trade association, but that, that's what we are. We represent a commercial fishermen, recreational fishermen, party boat skippers, folks who manufacture and sell fishing gear, restaurants. We have a tribal board member. It's the whole California salmon fishing community. Um, we were organized about 15 years ago because, frankly, our um, industry is literally fighting for survival. Uh, so I'm going to talk not just about salmon, not just about fish, but the people who depend on those fish. 
So to start with, I'm going to talk about the Central and Fall Run today. Um, fall Run is one of the unlisted runs uh, in the uh, in the, uh, uh, the ESA consultation process. Uh, you're primarily talking about about Spring Run, Winter Run, Steelhead. Fall Run is not a listed run, but it suffers from exactly the main the same main drivers that are affecting the uh, the, the listed runs as well. Um, the fall run is the backbone of salmon fishing, not just in California. Uh, the fall run in the Central Valley, especially in the Sacramento Valley, is the, the, the most robust, traditionally, the most robust run south of the Columbia River. So without a healthy Sacramento River salmon run, um, not only do we not have salmon fishing in California, we don't have salmon fishing in coastal Oregon, because most of coastal Oregon salmon come from the Central Valley. Um, when that industry is healthy, when that fishery is healthy, when we have healthy salmon runs, um, these are 10 year old numbers. It's about a $1.4 billion industry with 23,000 jobs. Those are 10 year old numbers. So those numbers today would be higher. Um, but the value of that fishery today is zero. Um, there's a complete shutdown in salmon fishing in California in 2023 and 2024. And I just want to make sure I take a moment to observe the fact that the human cost of that environmental degradation is really profound. We have board members who I work for. Um, one of them has lost 75% of the customers on his boat. The other one has lost 80 plus percent of her annual income last year and this year. Um, I know a family in a salmon fishing business it's frankly being torn apart right now because they're trying to figure out how to help their family business survive the shutdown, trying to figure out how long it's going to last. It's just important to note that there is an enormous human toll from the environmental degradation that you're focused on today. And that's not just true the, for the fishing industry. I hope you're going to hear later from uh, communities in the Delta that are seeing uh, enormous impacts on their communities. And I hope you hear from tribes. I spent the last two days with a, with a salmon tribe in the Central Valley um, who feels a profound impact from the decline of their salmon resources. As you're focused on those, in, those environmental impacts, but I just want to make sure you're reflecting on the fact that there is a very real human cost from uh, the decline of the Bay Delta ecosystem. Well, one last just big picture note, and that is right now, we're almost entirely dependent for the fish we catch in, in prior to the shutdown. On, um, on fish that come from our hatcheries and fish that we truck from our hatcheries because we're essentially slowly sterilizing Central Valley rivers from a salmon perspective. I just want to uh, focus here on some, some numbers because you may not have been as focused on the fall run numbers. Um, for the decade from 1996 to 2005, the average wild spawning population in the upper Sacramento River was over 175,000 fish. That's wild spawning fish in the upper Sacramento River for those 10 years, not just one year, but for those 10 years. Uh, the fall run escapement last year in 2023 in the Sacramento River, the wild spawning escapement was 6,160 fish. Um, that's a 96 plus percent decline in just 20 years. It really is an absolutely astonishing collapse of uh, an, an astonishingly important and productive ecosystem. Um, there are plenty of stressors for salmon. What are the driving stressors? Um, flow and temperature, and of course, temperature in the Central Valley system uh, is enormously controlled by water. Flow and temperature, water, water management in the Central Valley are the drivers of, uh, of the decline of California's uh, uh, Central Valley salmon runs. Uh, as a result of that, we've seen absolutely catastrophic survival of juvenile salmon in, uh, in, in, in our recent drought years. Uh, now one other data point I wanted to mention, and that is that you can see the impact of flow on our rivers and temperature on our rivers by looking at the Little McCallany River, one of the Delta tributaries. It's a tiny river. Um, um, and while the Sacramento River has had catastrophically low returns, 6,000 fish, so we're not catching a single fish in the ocean right now. And despite a complete shutdown in, in salmon fishing, we only saw 6,000 fish come up to the Sacramento River. What happened to the McCallum River? An all time record, almost 30,000 fish returned to the McCallum River. That's a tiny river. The previous record was only 20,000 fish. So we've seen a dramatic return of an all time record return since we started keeping records in the McCallum. Why is that? 
It's because those fish on the McCallany are trucked around the bad river conditions, around the delta, and they're really downstream of the delta. They bypass the, the, the lethal river conditions that we're seeing right now. That's the reason, the only reason, we're seeing such um, remarkable returns on the McCallany and catastrophic it's on the second river and that I think that that data point is really important. Um, when I've done in introductions to speeches like this, comments like this, I've always said that we work on three things. We work on uh, hydrology, hatcheries, and habitat. Um, and by habitat, I mean the physical stuff. Flow is habitat, but the physical stuff, floodplains, side channels, gravel, spawning gravels, and so forth. We don't work on habitat because it is flow management that is driving our salmon runs to extinction. And we know that we have to turn around water management in order to start restoring those runs to the point where habitat, restored physical habitat can make a difference. Um, the problem as one of uh, my fishermen friends, um, when they're asked, when he was asked about habitat, about, about uh, floodplain restoration, he said, the problem we've seen during the drought is the dead fish don't use floodplains. We are killing our juvenile salmon in the rivers for warm temperature. Um, frankly, under those conditions, it doesn't matter how much habitat restoration we build. In addition to the fact that during dry years, um, new, new floodplains are, um, are not inundated um, to, to a great extent. So what are the keys to, uh, to reversing this decline, not just for the listed runs of, uh, of salmon, but also for the enlisted fall run? It's simple. It's biological opinions under the ESA and state water port based built a plan update that significantly slow temperature to restore temperature conditions. Uh, we need to reintegrate science into decision making. Frankly, um, we've had a real problem with that, with a, with a breakdown of, uh, of the integration of science into decision making in the last several years on a different scale of the state and federal levels, uh, but very significantly. And then I want to spend a little time on a process I don't know if you've heard much about, and that is the um, our position is that the biological opinions and the Bay Delta plan should not be based on a proposal called the Bay Delta uh, Voluntary Agreements, also called the Health and Rivers and Landscapes Initiative, uh, generally called the Voluntary Agreements or the VAs. And Gary's slide mentioned that briefly, and I just want to touch on those briefly because we see that that, that is a proposal by water users, including the Department of Water Resources. Um, no environmental groups, um, no fishing groups, no tribal groups, no environmental justice groups, none of the folks who either advocate for healthy ecosystems or suffer from the decline of those ecosystems are at the table. This is a water user-led proposal as a substitute for a science-based um, state water board on Bay Delta plan update. And I just want to talk just about the failure of voluntary agreements to incorporate science. And the reason I'm mentioning that is because there is a proposal, the, v, the, 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 the voluntary agreement proposal is a proposal to substitute for the direction the state water board was going into um, in terms of adopting an unfair flow approach. Um, it's also a proposal to uh, be integrated in the ESA biology of biological opinions, both in the short and long term. So um, uh, just as Gary talked about um, temporary urgency change petitions, you need to keep your eye on that ball. This is another ball that's important to keep our eye on. And that is the, the fact that the voluntary agreements which are being proposed as a critical part of biological opinions and a Bay Delta plan update don't incorporate credible science. And so what do I mean by that? I mean, there is no support for the overall level of environmental flows in the VAs. Uh, there's no support for the core hypothesis in the voluntary agreements, which is that we can substitute large scale floodplain restoration or significant flow improvements. Um, no smart biological goals and objectives. You can't design a science based program. You can't evaluate a program. You certainly can't do adaptive management for a program that doesn't have targets. Does, literally does not have smart biological goals and objectives, doesn't have temperature uh, protections, uh, doesn't have delta flow requirements, and has inadequate um, tributary flow uh, uh, contributions. Um, we're not alone in being critical of the science in the voluntary agreements. This is a quote from uh, EPA um, Region 9 in a letter to the State Water Board. 
um, simply stating that the State Water Board's summary of analysis of voluntary agreements does not yet include a sound scientific rationale that demonstrates how the proposed voluntary agreement alternative will, pro will provide protections for all designated uses. I think Gary's slides also mention the lack of of flow improvements in critical years. Those are the years in which we've seen the most catastrophic declines in the system. And I just want to review the details there for a moment. Um, there's literally no proposal to improve flows in status quo flows in the Feather, Yuba, and McCall neighbors in the voluntary agreements. Astonishingly, on the Sacramento River on the main stem, there's a proposal to provide 2,000 acre feet of additional flow on the Sacramento River. 2,000 acre feet just by just by way of scale. Um, uh, and average year flows in the whole Sacramento River Basin is about 20 million acre feet, roughly. So we're talking about a number that is one one hundredth of one percent of average year flows. The idea that you can move the needle on the Sacramento River with 2,000 acre feet of water is absurd. Frankly, um, um, I invite Dave to ask if they can actually even measure how to. It, it even measure 2,000 acre feet of water um, in terms of changing the status quo on the, on the main stem of the, of the Sacramento River. Um, two month of more things I want to mention about the voluntary agreements. One is that um, they include a proposal that would layer water on top of the status quo, new VA flows, tiny little sliver, but a little water, but it wouldn't protect the status quo. So under an, an, an unpaired flow approach, you have an approach that actually protects a hydrograph. The voluntary agreement approach doesn't protect the status quo hydrograph. So it sets the stage for enormous new diversions. In, um, in, so it, it wouldn't be diversions of that little teeny sliver of, of voluntary agreement flow, but enormous new diversions from existing um, uh, uh, environmental flows in that system. So we, the, the voluntary agreement approach by not protecting a specific hydrograph sets the stage for enormous environmental damage in the future. And then finally, voluntary agreements also propose to rely on, um, on uh, transfers and purchases of water to provide a significant amount of environmental flow. Um, um, we have plenty of experience with those kinds of, 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 of efforts to provide environmental water through water purchases. Um, they have a pretty poor track record. Um, I worked on a report called the Building Blocks Report with Defenders of Wildlife a couple of years ago that looks at um, the track record of 18 environmental block of water programs across the country. One of the real clear lessons there is that programs that try to provide environmental water through purchases really struggle for a variety of reasons. Uh, again, we're not the only ones skeptical of the flow proposals in the voluntary agreements. Uh, this is a letter from EPA to the State Water Board. VA flow assets provide only minimal benefits. EPA is concerned that the total volume and timing of built in flow and outflow provided under those VAs is not large enough to adequately restore and protect aquatic ecosystems. And then, during, interestingly, during critical dry years, the proposed yield of VA alternative will result in decreased flows for baseline forcing conditions, um, according to EPA. National Fisheries Services says essentially the same thing. Flow commitments identified in the VA term sheet would not provide a significant difference in average flow relative to the baseline. And we're highly uncertain that the voluntary agreement is currently proposed will provide for the reasonable protection of fish wildlife and beneficial uses. A couple of other things VA is struggling with beyond, beyond the science. The, the first is that the voluntary agreement process began in 2011. Since then, they have set eight deadlines for a complete package, but we still don't have a complete package. They've really struggled with producing a deadline. Frankly, I think there's an enormous incentive in the VA process to not complete a, a process in order to argue for continued delay. Uh, and then finally, there are big parts of the volunteer agreement that are just missing. I mentioned the lack of smart biological goals and objectives. They're still missing pieces of the science plan. They don't have a funding plan. They haven't figured out the roles of both tribes. They don't have complete proposals for data management, publication of transparency. Uh, and then they're missing some important enforcement pieces. The VA process, frankly, is not a credible proposal, but it is still proposed as a cornerstone of the state water plans, uh, state water boards being update and the biological um, opinions that you are uh, here. 
Uh, so I'm just going to close with this slide that um, the, the key solutions from a salmon fishing perspective are pretty clear. We need uh, biological opinions and state water board uh, plans that, that the state water would be able to plan that significantly improves flow and temperature conditions. Uh, we need desperately we need those processes to integrate science effectively. We need to make sure they're not based on current Bay Delta voluntary groups. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I think you're going to sit or? I'm going to sit. I have no slides. So that was the last PowerPoint you're going to see today. So <laughs> breathe the sigh of relief a little bit. Yeah. Um, I also saw the writing on the wall a little bit earlier this morning. I was here at nine and I figured that um, we were going to go a little over. Um, <laughs> uh, I've also had the pleasure of watching your previous meetings and figured that you would appreciate just a little bit of a briefer wrap up. I will also promise to attend future meetings. So if you have anything that you would like to discuss with me, future, I want to make myself available too. So I promise this is not the last time you're going to see me. So um, I think to start with, uh, it should be you noted know, Defenders of Wildlife is an interested party in the reconsultation LTO process, and we have been since 2021. Um, and so I have um, sincere gratitude, frankly, for all the agencies that have participated in such a heavy lift. Um, and sincere gratitude for my colleagues here on this panel who frankly have been working collectively as long as I've been alive on Bay Delta issues. Um, so while I appreciate the biography, thank you. Um, I do wanna make a note that um, in the last two years in this position, I've learned quite a bit. And the majority of my time has been spent either in related processes in the LTO process or the long-term operations um, with either agencies or on the update of the Bay Delta water quality plan as at least 50% of my job. The other 50% is on Central Valley wetlands, which is, you have gotten an idea of still interrelated and impacted by the LTO process and project operations. So I'm gonna skip over some of what you have already heard and I'm happy to submit this in writing. So you can of course review at your pleasure. Um, and you've also heard the importance of a political stressor uh, frankly, not an ecological one. I don't have a science background, but I do have a law one, so I'm going to name a political stressor, which is the fact that we don't have updated water quality standards for the Bay Delta under the Clean Water Act, and we haven't had meaningful ones since 1995. You're aware. It should be noted. It is a big part of one of the reasons why we have incorporated additional stronger, hopefully, requirements into the reconsultation process, and more pressure has been put on it to do something, frankly, that under the ESA, NEPA, CEQA, um, and the other laws that are structuring or governing that process should also be done under the Clean Water Act. Um, so uh, the questions that were given to panelists this morning kind of structured my original comments, but I'm going to kind of skip to question number four, which is, do you have comments specific to the three actions in the statement of task? Yes, I do. Thank you so much for asking. Um, <laughs> Dr. Rosenfield this morning highlighted briefly alternative three, which is an operational alternative in the Bureau of Reclamation's uh, proposed action that's out right now in the reconsultation process. And if you weren't waiting with bated breath for the DEIS to be released to the public on July 26th, I certainly was. So I would like to highlight just a couple quotes there for you for describing alternative three. Um, and these sites are actually from a different part of the DEIS than John uh, enumerated this morning. So it's Appendix E, just for reference. It's a little bit of a long document. Um, pages 161 through 169. So alternative three or the modified natural hydrograph um, represents actions heavily informed by nonprofits. Defenders of Wildlife was one of them along with many other talented colleagues. Implementation of this alternative may require additional authorities and actions by parties beyond reclamation and DWR. It combines additional delta outflows with measures to improve drought protection and temperature management through increased reservoir carryover storage. Alternative three includes authorizing legislation, water rights, contracts, and agreements as described by common components through the DEIS. I say that because you've heard a lot today from various different perspectives about the limits of different knobs that you can turn, um, of different um, limits for different stakeholders, frankly, and different designated uses, and the tensions there. 
Um, we've gone as far as to put in an alternative here that is being analyzed by agencies to look at some of those. I would just request this committee look at those modeling assumptions, what's gone into alternative three, and really look, you know, ask us questions, ask the Bureau questions about it. Um, I think that it's just progress that would be helpful if illuminated a little bit more in detail in your research when you, in future convenings. Um, I also want to highlight something that John touched on briefly, that alternative uh, three applies a different priority order um, for meeting downstream demands. I highly encourage you to look at that as well. Um, in my opinion, it actually does meet a lot of the legal baseline requirements that go in to these project operations. Specifically, Shasta management, water temperature management, um, and Old and Middle River reverse flows, winter and spring delta outflow. Literally, the quote here is this component replaces the spring pulse flow component seen in the no action alternative and alternatives one, two, and four. Winter spring delta outflow criteria are intended to reduce the adverse impacts of project operations on listed species by increasing abundance and productivity of long fin smelt, increasing survival of winter run Chinook salmon, spring run Chinook salmon, and Central Valley steelhead as a result of increased flows that increase survival in the Sacramento River and increase survival through the Delta, increasing therefore recruitment of Delta smelt and increasing survival and abundance of green sturgeon. In addition to the requirements under decision 1641 and consistent with modeling demonstrating that operations are reasonably likely to meet storage requirements described above, on a monthly basis, Reclamation and DWR shall operate to meet the Delta outflow criteria in table E-23. And again, I'll send that to you, I promise. I wasn't gonna show you the table up here. You can, you can read it, I promise yourselves. Um, it's thrilling. And <laughs> I think another highlight that I wanted to point out since it has been briefly touched on is the governance requirements for alternative three. It's generally the same as alternative two, which is the proposed action or preferred alternative here except that the water management teams, for example, the Shasta Water Interagency Management Team or the Water Operations Management Team will be comprised solely of staff from federal and state agencies and Native American tribes. Two fisheries agencies, NIMPS, US Fish and Wildlife Service and California Department of Fish and Wildlife will make final decisions regarding water project operations if the issue is not resolved in the management team process. That is not how it is today. The last question that was posed to panelists was what Sentinel Publications Research support your positions? I would like to highlight that John has a link to an online literature review. Many of us have developed lots of those literature reviews to inform and support our comments that are being submitted as part of this LTO process, which has been a robust finale this summer, um, truly. Um, and so I believe that John's really frankly covers all of those citations, but if there's anything in there that you still need, please contact one of us. Um, and then really to summarize in conclusion, despite coordination efforts between agencies, especially improved in this LTO process, I have to give them credit. It is clear from the draft documents upon my review this summer um, in the LTO process that additional communication and coordination could be done. Um, and I, I think that how that committee wants to approach that is something that I look forward to future discussions on. And then two, defenders and others have long articulated what could be improved, going as far as an operational alternative scenario, which warrants more attention review and hopefully one day implementation and application. And then it takes, finally, all of this political will. The reports from this committee cannot be understated with how valuable that could be um, to help with our issue of lack of political will here. Um, we can reintroduce resilience into the system with your help. Resilience in the form of flow, resilience in the form of some of these other actions that we've talked about. It's definitely possible. I wanted to end on a, a hopeful note here for you. I, th I do think it is possible and we are in a step in the right direction and we need your help to do to get there. Thank you. Great way to wrap up. So we'll 
open it for committee questions, and I think we'll be running for about 15, about 15 minutes later, and then I'll schedule on the agenda, uh, because we will have about 20 minutes for the open mic. So for those folks who ask to make comments, we're going to ask you to limit your comments in the open mic session to just two minutes each, and if you can concentrate on uh, resources or information that you can point us to, given that short amount of time, we'd appreciate it. So let's open it for uh, questions. Let's see, we haven't heard from Jerry. Oh, uh, would you like to I, did, that? I just have one for you. Um, it was interesting. You had a nice set of statistics to describe what the hydrograph and hydrology is going to reach. And he said, okay, so we should reproduce exactly that uh, to make the picture okay. And I don't understand why necessarily all of those parameters are required. It may not be that the fish are particularly active at a particular time. Uh, what's your response? Right. So it's not, I mean, there's variability, right? Like it's not exactly a target number. We have um, for different water year types, you'd have, you know, dry years, lower flows than wet years, obviously. So I don't know if that's what you're getting at. But if, but are you talking about the five functional flow components yeah, that you may yeah, not all, need? All of those. Are they all really important? We, yeah, in, in our in our work, we found that they are all really important. There are some rivers that don't have all of them. So, um, you know, some of them don't have a fall pulse, for example. Um, some rivers have a less predictable spring recession, but that's where the modeling gets in. So it comes into play. So we have a paper out that shows how we modeled all of these metrics. And in certain rivers, you'd have, you know, a, a, a much different shape than others. So the, the example I showed is more typical of a snowmelt hydrograph. There's obviously very flashy rivers, there's ephemeral rivers, but in our modeling work, we tried to capture what those flow components would look like in that particular place. It could be that there are some flow components that aren't as important, right? Like maybe even though your flow pulses, you know, only happens once every five years in a certain river, maybe it's not as much of a trigger in some rivers as others. But that's where, if you read our, um, our whole framework document, there's a section I don't want to go into too much detail. There's a there's a section that says like here's kind of the template of how we would do this, and there's another one where it says here's how you would bring in local information and data if you think that your place does not function the same as kind of this you know broader template that we have for all rivers. So there is kind of a way to go back, and then there's a third one that said a third section of the of the template that says. Um, you know, this is what you would do if you have enough water to do it. If you have competing management objectives and you're using less water, here's a process where you would talk about what your kind of management goals are and, and do some trade-offs analysis. So so it's all kind of captured there, I think, to look at special cases like that. Does that get at what you were? Yes, thank you. Okay. Yeah. Well, thank you. Would you like? Um, first, I just want to say thank you for showing up and making time. Um, yeah, uh, probably no surprise to the panel. These are all people who are familiar to me and who I appreciate uh, for many reasons because they're all in their own way very integrated thinkers. And one of the things that I got out of your presentation that I'm embarrassed to say I never really digested in this way before, but it is how the, we've had a lot of conversation in the panel about and other panels have said that how the changing dual priorities of the state project and the federal project make it difficult to manage the system. And also we've heard a lot about the need for collaboration in different at different scales in different places. And one of the things I got out of your presentation today was the absence of uh, assertive regulation has created a context in which those things happen way more than they might otherwise. In which it's, I think about like my daughter and how she is where there aren't boundaries created. <laughs> and uh, anyway, so that was like a really fun transmission. Thank you for that. Um, and then my question is, having read the kind of more narrow scope of our charge as it's written, like, I wonder, I would love to hear some of your opinions, um, any of yours really, but like, uh, especially um, Julie and Gary and Ian, like, 
How do you think the project is doing at, at tending to fish? So you alluded to it, but I want to like, like tell, tell me directly. And also, like, if you could change a few things, like, what would you do right away in the context of, you know, as Sam named really articulately this morning, this co equal goal paradigm that we have in the context of, you know, all the different human needs, like, you know, what if you were in control given our charge, what, what would you do? Who would like to do that? <laughs> yeah, who I have an answer. <laughs> Thank you, Renee. That was a really gracious appreciation, too. Um, poorly. I think the projects are doing poorly in managing for fish, and there's a lot of data. You know, I don't. We don't have to model it, we see it. Um, what I would do, and this is a question I also pose to the Delta Science panel is, you know, we keep talking about being at this brink, this brink, this brink. Well, if we're at a brink, then there must be some things to help get us to the other side that are not negotiable. And maybe that's, you know, we can keep diverting water and not from the Yuba or not from the feather. At some point, there is enough science to make a decision. That's kind of the point of what I was saying. And so there's a cost to delay, and that cost is opportunity. So we've lost opportunities, I think, to be, you know, generous and maybe co-equal, you know, co-equal to what state, just like subsistence. I guarantee that's not what water users think of their like success outcome that they're subsisting in their industry. But that is what we're talking about when we talk about environmental function, just as it's subsisting basically. Um, so, so just to reiterate, my ask would be, I would really like a clear declaration of what options we've lost and what are the non-negotiable things that must be done moving forward where we have lost flexibility. And it's not to say anybody's gonna do it, but I think it's important to go in eyes wide open as to what we're giving away if we don't. Yeah. Um, so the, the 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 nutshell version of my answer for is, um, and let me preface it by saying that there are a lot of great people who work for DWR and the Bureau um, who you know are good scientists, have good values, etc. But essentially. The projects they work for are geared to uh, maximize water supply, water deliveries, um, and they will comply with the minimum regulatory requirements that they have to. I mean, that's just sort of that's how you operate the business, and so you have to change the business model, and that means to a certain extent that regulators need to do their job. I don't see a way around that, and I think that means that um, we need to move to. Um, a system where some regime that meets ecological thresholds for biological response and ecosystem function are met more often than not. We just need to create good opportunities, you know, more often than we're, we're getting now. Some, some threshold, you know, two thirds of the time, whatever it is. I mean, I, you know, and we could play, you know, I, I mean, we don't need to get it perfect, but we need to, we need to change you know, change, we, we need to go from one third to two thirds or something like that. We need to have something like that. And um, and then, and this is way beyond, I think, you know, maybe way beyond your scope, but, um, you know, there are, if we're clear about what we want for ecosystem protection and what it takes to have a sustainable ecosystem, and it's not like at some point you just, you know, I mean, you you either do it or you don't, you know? You can say we, we can collaborate to death uh, or we can actually do some things that might be painful, but that's what it takes to save the ecosystem. That will drive the innovation in water management um, and investment uh, necessary to adapt to changing circumstances. I mean, that's what's always happened with changes in, uh, in water management. And I suspect it will happen if, if that's the decision that is made to actually do the things necessary to reach thresholds of protection. So first, how is the system doing? I agree with Anne poorly. 
what I would change. So um, let me tell you just a brief story. So what, something I was tasked with one of my earlier projects at the Nature Conservancy was to see if we could go out and buy water to basically put on top of the regulations in the Central Valley just to improve condition over. And um, the answer is no, we can't. It's impossible for anybody to go out and buy water and put it in stream to make anything better. And it took me a while of digging in there, digging through all of this to figure out why. And the why, as far as I understand it, the simplified why, I mean, I know there's like the complexities of why, right? But the simplified version of why is that there's the set of regulations that, you know, they're all kind of piled on top of each other, right? Um, from the state water board, from this process, from whatever processes there are that are loose constraints on the system, except when there's a temporary urgency, you know, petition or whatever it is, loose constraints. So those are always negotiated, always. They're not based on what's going to protect the ecosystem, but they are meant to say, we're not going to, you know, have a mass fish kill in the next five years. It's somewhere between, between there, but they're negotiated. They're not science-based. Everything else is given to water users. So you have to meet basically the Delta outflow requirement. Any other water there is, is given to water users as long as it can be stored and transported. Anything that goes out of the Delta above that regulation is just because they can't store it or transport it. So there's no way to put water on top of that because there's no way to protect it out or even to measure it because, you know, even an organization like mine can't buy enough water to kind of be within that, that variability, you know, there's a huge volume, right? So there's that. And then there's the fact that water demand is insatiable. And this is what I've come to. It's not that I don't care about urban use or agricultural use. I do very much, but the more supply you have, the more the demand's gonna be, it just doesn't end. So there's environmental needs, there's an insatiable demand that is always whatever's left over. And so in my perspective, let's be science-based about actually managing toward the environmental needs and constrain the water supply portion of it. Are people gonna be upset with that? Yes, there are no win-win situations in the Central Valley in, our water management system, there are not. And people are always gonna be mad because there's an insatiable, I mean, the more water there is, the more people are gonna go into farming and more marginal lands, right? It's not like, the question isn't, are we gonna have agriculture in California or not? It's just how much of our landscape are we willing to put into production? So we have to make some choices about what we're willing to do with our rivers and know that everything else is gonna be diverted as much as is possible. And I just feel that nobody has made the effort or the tough choices to say, this is what we want to achieve for our environmental outcomes. And that has to be done at some point. And it's not what we're doing now. Thank you. Um, if I go to Barry and then she... I'll, I'll just throw two quick numbers out there. First, I hadn't been planning to mention this number, but I will because of Ashley's comment, uh, uh, um, um, Julie's comment about insatiable demand. In the last 15 years in the Central Valley, we have planted about 500 square miles of new almonds in the Central Valley. 80% um, of the world's uh, almond product production comes out of the Central Valley. It's about about 10 times the size of the city and county of San Francisco. 500 square miles of new almonds is just a staggering amount of demand for new water. Um, virtually all of that land was either converted from, from either land that was not irrigated or land that was irrigated, but in a less intensive way than, mat than, than mature almonds require. Um, um, get to Renee's question about, about how the Central Valley is doing. Um, one simple number, you saw it on one of Julie's graphics, and that is a reference to, to the doubling goal. Uh, under both state law and federal law, there is a goal of doubling the natural production of an anadromous fish in the Central Valley between 67 and 91. Um, uh, that number, again, this is natural production, not hatchery production of salmon. Um, um, that goal is just under a million fish of uh, naturally produced fish, 990,000 fish. Uh, it's written into Central Valley Project Improvement Act. It's written into state law. 
It's written into the existing uh, Bay Delta plan, which was adopted in 1995. So we have a metric for how we're doing overall. That's all salmon runs. Um, um, the, the, the goal is 990,000. Um, uh, and I actually don't remember what the naturally produced, I, I don't actually, I don't think the agencies have produced the, the doubling numbers for this year, but when you back out hatchery production in the Central Valley, um, we're at a tiny fraction of a, of, of a few percent of, uh, of that doubling goal. So there, there's a there's a really objective metric under federal law and, and state law and the state board's plan for how we're doing. And the answer is we're doing catastrophically from the salmon perspective. Chief, do you have a final comment on Sure. Um, <laughs> Defenders believes that the operation of these water systems severely impacts um, protected and listed species, um, and most importantly, declining species. Um, I think it's important to note that this committee heard at your very first meeting um, about the take situation at the pumps this year. Um, an update, maybe, on how that went would be prudent before this committee. Um, they definitely exceeded, far exceeded their incidental take limits for steelhead and winter run Chinook salmon. Um, and then what we want, in short, um, protection of water quality for all beneficial uses, um, which must include water for people and wildlife. And that means adequate flow in all tributaries and the Delta. And um, this frankly translates to long-term operations and biops that include adequate enforceable requirements regarding Shasta operations, water storage and water temperatures, adequate delta outflows to protect delta smelt, longfin smelt and other species, as well as address salinity intrusion. You need to include adequate delta operational measures, including a San Joaquin River inflow export ratio, which is not in the scope, by the way, of this reconsultation process. And then the long-term operations and new biops also need to require enforceable water temperature requirements on the American Stanislaus and Clear Creek just to name a few, but we do have like a full outline of what we ideally would want. And that's just lim limited to your scope of task, frankly. If you wanted to ask me of what I wanted ideally in my position, I could go on forever. Um, but that's just the name of you. And um, thanks for the question, Renee. Yeah, well, thank you. And uh, we are running out of time, but we'd be very grateful. I see there's still some questions from the committee. So uh, if you do have the time just to stick around afterwards for a quick one-on-one -on -one with those questions we didn't get to, we'd be very grateful. And of course, any materials that you wish to send to Laura and the National Academies, the committee, the committee will be uh, very grateful for that. So we could just thank the NGO folks for uh, such a Now we're going to go through just a few questions uh, in the open mic session. And what I'm going to do in case people need to get on the road, we'll take the people in the room first of all, and then we'll go to the people who wish to comment online. So on the list, uh, the first speaker is Cindy. And again, if you, Cindy Meyer, from the uh, San Luis and Delta Mendoza Political Authority. Um, it looks like she's online. Oh, she's online. OK. Um, that's great. Okay, Cindy, we, we will come back to you in just a moment. And Jay Ziegler, this is Jay here. Yeah. Jay, Jay, Jay online. Um, Brian Shinstock from Roseville Electric. And Kiko Mertz from Friends of the River. That's great. So we can go and scream <laughs> like <laughs> Can I ask my question before they leave? <laughs> um, um, Maya, how do you want to do this? Should we just go through the list and uh, can you bring them up? Sure. And so if Cindy is online, sorry about that, Cindy, please go ahead.
Yes, Cindy, I think you might still be on mute. She pulled over. Um, she declined. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. Um, let's see, the next view is from the Contra Costa Water District, uh, Ching Fu Chang. Yeah, I don't think he or she was going to speak. We we're uncertain about that one. Okay. Uh, the next on my list is Brett Baker from the Central uh, Delta Water Agency. I don't see him. Either. You don't see him? Hey, this is great. Ben <laughs> <laughs> Spain with the Pacific Coast Federation of Fisheries Associations and the Institute of Fisheries Resources. Is Glenn with us? Great. So, Glenn, if you'd like to go ahead, probably realize you may have a little more time. Is he the, is he the last person on your list? He looks, he looks to be muted. So, I think, Glenn, you're still muted. Could you try and mute, mute him? Okay. He declined to be. I've got a raised hand, but okay, Glenn. Uh, perhaps put a note in the. Is he declining? In, in, in the chat. Okay, great. Um, is Darcy Austin with us from the State Water Contractors? Yeah. Yeah. Right. Maybe we should. Uh, no. Oh. Uh, Thaddeus Bretner. Oh. Bad. From the Sac River uh, Settlement Contractors. That's great. Well, it's not great, but um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we had on just a little long, and of course, the reason for that is we were trying, in respect of people's time across the agency, and so now uh, putting this into just a one-day meeting, and I, I think the plan to the whole that it's perhaps a little bit too compressed. So with that, we're going to finish exactly on time. <laughs> uh, but please, uh, for the speakers that are still with us in the room, uh, there were a lot more questions from the committee members, so if you wouldn't mind hanging out for a little while and then the committee can move across to uh, uh, follow up with you on a one by one. And I think just on behalf of the committee, we'd like to say thank you again to everyone who participated, uh, whether it was the 50 plus online and the 50 or so in this room. We've really appreciated your participation, particularly from the all of the panelists today that put so much effort into the presentations and provided us with the background material. So with that way closed, I'll pass to Laura. Did you have anything you wish to? I just wanted to say there is an open session tomorrow from noon to one. We'll, we will be hearing from John Hero of the USGS. You're welcome to either join us in person or online. If you're joining us in person, bring your lunch with you because it will be a lunchtime affair, but we only have food to feed the committee. Um, and I don't know what the Zoom link is, but I'm assuming that- It's the same Zoom link. The same Zoom link is today. Great, okay, that's it. Thanks, Laura. Thanks, everyone. Uh, let's give the panelists in the back a, a final round of applause.